for a concert. Uh, now I will get to the reason we're all here this evening. Uh, let me introduce Andrew Carl. Uh, Andrew is professor of history and African American studies at the University of Virginia. His research focuses on social, political, and environmental history of real estate, land use, and taxation in 20th century America. He teaches courses on race and real estate in post-World War II America, the civil rights movement, and American cities in the 20th century. His first book, this land, The Land Was Ours, Amer African American Beaches from Jim Crow to the Sun Belt South, uh, published in uh, 2012, received the uh, OAH Liberty Legacy Foundation Award. Uh, Carl has received fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Andrew W. Mellif uh, Mellon Foundation, and the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard University. He has written about the issue of public beach access in the New York Times and other publications, and is finishing a book uh, on the modern struggle for public access to beaches in Connecticut, America's most privatized shoreline. His current work examines the history of discrimin discriminatory taxation against African Americans and explores the shadowy, shadowy world of tax lien investing, its impact on urban minority neighborhoods, and its role for shaping real estate markets. And this is a copy, my copy of his book, uh, which I found incredibly useful, crucial, in developing the exhibit upstairs uh, with, with the personal knowledge of individuals that Reginald was able to put me in contact with. Then uh, Professor Carl's uh, work here, I was able to, I believe, produce a fairly uh, accurate uh, exhibit. So uh, enjoy, and uh, Professor Carl, I'll get out of your way. Well, well, well thank you so much, Alan. Um, um, thank you for inviting me down here. Thank you also uh, to Will Pell, who um, really helped organize, uh, help organize this and make sure that I, you know, we were able to find a time that I could come down and um, share some of my work with you. And it's really, in many ways, um, this brings the work that I've done on the history of African American beaches full circle because one of the first sites that I studied, one of the first places I went when I was doing research um, on this many years ago was to um, Hampton University and to go through the archival collections that they have there on, the, on Bayshore Beach, um, which was at the time, um, and it might still be, it was an unprocessed archive, which is um, essentially what that means is it's boxes of just filled with papers and you have to sort through them and figure them they're not, there's um, not in any sort of order and it was uh, a fascinating, um, illuminating uh, experience for me and one that really allowed me to uh, absorb the totality of, of this site's history, the people um, who came, who passed through in various ways, all the various institutions that were involved in its, in its history, um, and the culture that was being shaped within this space. And it gave me a deep sense of appreciation for the importance, not just of Bayshore Beach um, in the history of um, Hampton, uh, but also just more broadly about you know that there was something really deep um, and profound about all these places um, that I began to um, piece together. And as well, as I'll talk about a little bit um, tonight, um, began to see how many of the African American beaches that I write about were also themselves connected in various ways um, through a network of musicians, uh, performers, um, and crowds. So, um, so I'm really excited to talk a little bit more about the local history here, but also connect it to um, a history that is national in scope um, and spans um, really the you know, 19th through the 20th century. And so much of this story, as, um, as, as the title of my book suggests, um, is very much um, centered in, in, and grows out of the struggle for land and its import, central importance in the long um, struggle for freedom um, following emancipation and continuing through the 20th century. And um, in, in many respects, you know, my project, which began with an interest in looking at um, these particular social spaces, um, began to really as well incorporate this focus on the importance of the owning, this, owning these type, the, the land and what that meant um, to the communities and what that meant in a broader set of um, struggles that we've come to understand as being central to uh, the civil rights movement as a whole. And I think, again, just kind of step back a minute and just you know, to emphasize here 
the, you know, how important land ownership was to African American visions of freedom after slavery. You know, this was captured in the famous um, phrase, 40 acres and a mule, the idea um, that formerly enslaved persons um, would be given some form of material compensation for centuries of enslavement, um, for building the South um, and building the, the, um, the lands that they had been forced to work on. Um, and that phrase itself, you know, again, first sort of, you know, uttered and um, out, you know, in the wake of emancipation in um, the South Carolina Sea Islands, um, really captured uh, freedmen and women's hope for some measure of compensation and visions of what freedom would mean, not just, um, you know, freedom from enslavement, but also the means to become free, which in an agricultural-based society meant having land to yourself. Um, but as we, so we, as we know, that idea of land as compensation and land as a, as, a, as a means of becoming free became a bitter pill that African Americans were forced to swallow. That instead of land, uh, formerly enslaved persons in the South were given nothing but freedom. Um, you know, as the Union Army uh, withdrew from the South and as white Northerners retreated from the promise of Reconstruction, um, many formerly enslaved persons fell victims to new forms of slavery, you know, sharecropping and debt peonage and convict labor and other forms of ways in which um, the region slid back from that sort of early promise. And, but nevertheless, you know, African Americans' belief in the promise of land ownership and its central importance never died. Um, and in fact, only grew stronger as African Americans were being stripped of their civil rights and denied equal protection under the law um, and told that separate was equal by the Supreme Court. And, and as the South really descended into um, Jim Crow, and as you know, you know, African Americans were seeing their civil rights being t stripped from them, they clung even harder and pursued even more um, with, you know, with a greater tenacity um, the acquisition of land, um, where it was available and where it could be acquired, and to develop this land base um, in the South um, became really central to the broader um, political, social, and cultural visions of African Americans um, born after emancipation and coming of age, um, really, as the South as a whole was, was um, descending into um, the period of Jim Crow. You know, you know, land ownership became vested with almost a mystical, you know, mythical quality, you know, as providing shelter in a storm. Um, and you can almost see here, and I kind of you know, sort of get, uh, allude to this here in this um, chart here, that you can see um, that the number of acres that African Americans are acquiring are almost going up in direct um, relation to the loss of those rights um, in other arenas of public life. That um, as you are seeing um, the promise of civil rights being taken away, you are seeing this pursuit of, of land as, as really um, becoming in itself a barometer of the race's progress, a measure of African American strides toward equality and demands for justice where it can be found. Um, and more immediately, land is providing physical security and autonomy from a brutally oppressive, exploitative, and violent um, society that, the South, that uh, many of the places that had large concentrations of black landowners were, were just descending into at this time. You know, owning property um, became synonymous, synonymous with citizenship itself for African Americans who were denied their rights as citizens in so many other areas. That, um, so this, again, is really the kind of you know, backdrop to um, looking at how these places um, and how the, um, you know, these um, particular um, sites that I write about um, had importance beyond just providing a place for socialization, a place for communities to come together. Um, they also be, you know, really became the glue that sort of held together um, you know, black communities as a whole, especially at this, at this moment. And so my, um, my book, The Land Was Ours, really tells the story of a particular class of black landowners and a particular type of black-owned land. Um, it focuses on 
you know, the individuals and groups who sought to acquire and develop land um, for, uh, for leisure and recreation, um, for commercial purposes, um, to you know, capitalize on um, the need, the demand um, amongst the segregated African American public for spaces of their own, um, and who were able to acquire land in um, coastal areas. Um, beachfront properties, places um, you know that are hugging the sh you know the, the the Atlantic coastline, as well as lakes, rivers, and other bodies of water. Um, and this is significant. I think again, maybe something that is um, from our vantage point today. Um, might seem, you know, sort of strike as a little odd, but, you know, at the time in which the book begins in the late 19th century, um, at this period where you're seeing African Americans uh, pursuing and acquiring um, significant amounts of land across the South, is this is a time period where coastal areas, uh, many parts of the coastal South, um, were not places that were seen as, um, you know, valuable uh, real estate. You know, we think of today as like, you know, the pinnacle of achievement is being able to own a beachfront property. Well, you know, and maybe that was, is changing now as the, as the um, you know, as the threats of sea level rise, and we'll get to that at the end. But, but nevertheless, I mean, this is um, a time period where these are fairly remote, sparsely populated places that are kind of outside of the streams of commerce and uh, that are characteristic of, of the, uh, the the Black Belt and of the sort of really the areas of the South that um, where land was very difficult for African Americans to acquire. You know, places where, you know, a home of, you know, places with rich soil and large plantations. I mean, these were places that had very small numbers of African American independent land holders. Conversely, you know, in places uh, um, around the coastal South um, and other more remote areas um, that also happen to often be by bodies of water, these were areas that were sort of outside of the most densely populated, most, um, you know, seen as, you know, these were seen as areas that, where you could acquire land and acquire a measure of distance from the world of Jim Crow. Um, and, and one of the things that I kind of established at the beginning of the, of the book is that many parts of the coastal south that today are, you know, heavily populated and, um, you know, home to very valuable real estate were at this time, um, you know, very, very strikingly different. Um, and that as well, race relations were often different in these types of places than they were, say, in parts of um, the deep south. And, so this, again, this story here of focusing on these, this particular group of landowners um, and this particular type of land um, is significant for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because it, it helps us begin to understand the contours of, of, of black life behind the color line. That was really something that really I wanted to um, get historians and those who are looking at and understanding um, the struggle for racial justice in the 20th century to not just look at the fights to tear down barriers and the fights to desegregate, but also the fights to, and also the struggle to create worlds within um, the confines of this particular, um, of this particular era. So I look really at the history of segregation in Jim Crow um, through this lens, through the, through the, and through this vantage point, through the spaces that African Americans made for themselves. Um, you know, African Americans were indeed forced to contend with segregation in public life. Um, and that was no more so the case than in places of recreation, um, where, which were some of the most thoroughly segregated spaces um, across the South. I mean, the, you know, places like you know, beaches, swimming pools, parks, and resorts. I mean, these were um, places that were some of the most violently policed um, whites-only spaces you could find in the South. So you know, these, were, these were realities that generations of African Americans living under Jim Crow were forced to contend with. But as I you know, argue and show throughout the book, African Americans were never defined by that, and they refused to ever allow themselves to be defined by that. And the story of these places and their histories and the, and the vibrancy and the intrigue and all of the um, ways in which these were you know, really living histories, I think, helps to show that and, dem and, and drive that point home. So again, my focus here is telling a history of segregation, but also really telling the history of the places that black people made for themselves, how they worked to defy white racism and transcend the confines of Jim Crow. 
not just in politics, not just in the workplace, but also through these day-to-day -day aspects of our lives like just the simple pursuit of leisure and recreation. Um, Second, you know, the story of black beaches in these coastal areas is also really, as well, the story of the changing use, value, and condition of coastal land, um, really from the early 20th century to today. And I really look here at um, how uh, people are changing the environments they're living, but also how the environments are changing them. And, and really beginning to bring together this kind of, um, you know, a, a, an understanding here of how um, there was something very unique about um, living in um, coastal areas, living by the sea, living by the water, um, that um, was, is important to understanding um, the broader, um, the richness and diversity of the black experience as a whole during this time. Um, so, here as well, again, it's, this is a story of how these places that were once remote and inaccessible um, and often sparsely developed um, became to what they are today, some of the most valuable, coveted, and often overdeveloped areas in the U.S. And how these um, you know, profound changes in Americans' relationship with beaches um, and this exploding value of coastal property um, would have profound and often negative of consequences for the African American people who lived, played, and owned land there. Um, and it would have consequences for the land itself. Um, and how these kind of twin processes of, of, um, of changing, of changing you know, people and societies as well as changing fragile environments um, were interconnected. So let's first I get, go back to the kind of beginnings of this story. And I'll, and I'll do that by by way of, of um, talking about the, um, many of the places that I tell the story of throughout the book. Um, you know, my book really focuses on particular um, people and places and, 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 and communities that formed up around um, Black Beach Resorts, not just um, the, the sights, the sounds, but also the business of this, of, of developing land, of, of um, you know, tapping into a consumer marketplace, helping to create consumer marketplaces. And many of these places that would emerge um, as um, you know, vibrant social, cultural, and um, you know, commercial spaces for African Americans in the mid 20th century often began um, with, say, a, a single you know, person making an investment in property, um, seeking to acquire something that they could you know, farm, be able to um, you know, make their own. So you know, here, um, place, um, one of the places that I dwell on a lot th um, throughout the book and tell the story of is um, Cars and Sparrows Beach, um, located outside of Annapolis. And Cars and Sparrows Beach um, had its origins in um, an African-American man by the name of Frederick Carr, who in 1902 um, purchased 66 acres of farmland along the Chesapeake Bay. Um, with the hope of being able to um, engage in truck farming, um, be able to, again, sort of have um, you know, land that he could pass on to his um, children and to be able to sort of create a foundation um, that would provide a measure of security um, for himself and his family. Um, you know, hey, you know when um, when when Fred when the you know, Frederick Carr um, passed on, his children would then later develop this um, into what became really one of the largest African American amusement parks and resorts in the Mid Atlantic region. Um, and so I kind of you know look here at the, sort of both the origins and the individual stories, but also you know kind of tracing that through this tr changing use from what began as um, you know a, um, a small family-owned farm to becoming this um, you know very lucrative enterprise um, for the family that brought in as well um, many different um, other people who were seeking to capitalize on this uh, critical mass that was forming here. Um, I tell the story of people like William Brashears, um, a free African American who um, had acquired um, under slavery and then um, built up um, several dozen acres of, of waterfront property on, also on the Chesapeake, um, who then later sold that land um, to the children of Frederick Douglass, um, who in um, 1895 founded the um, elite black summer resort community of Highland Beach, 
um, which is um, in, um, also on we Maryland's western shore. Um, this became and remains to this day um, a, um, an important um, you know, site for African American, mostly uh, families from Washington, D.C., from Baltimore. These are doctors, um, college professors. The black professional class that really you know, grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, in the late 19th century, um, and who's you know, Frederick Douglass, you know, you know, lived um, his latter years in Washington, D.C., where he passed away as well. And his children um, you know, were um, spearheaded this effort to kind of you know, create a space that reflected the tastes and interests and sensibilities of this uh, black elite um, that had formed in the, um, in the nation's capital. And so these as well, um, you know, very significant in terms of both not just the, the folks who were coming through there, but also what that symbolized here, um, what, what it meant to have um, an elite resort that was founded by and for African American families um, here, you know, just um, you know, outside of the nation's capital. I also tell the story of um, R Robert Bruce Freeman, who acquired hundreds of acres of coastal property outside of Wilmington, North Carolina in the late, um, 19, uh, late 19th century, and where he and then later his children helped found this uh, black resort town known as Seabreeze, um, and also, that also became a very popular summer destination uh, for African Americans from across North and South Carolina um, through the 1950s and 60s. I tell the story, of course, of um, of the administration here at Hampton, at Hampton Institute, um, which in 1890 acquired uh, a stretch of beachfront property not far from here and built a seaside cottage there um, that initially was just aimed at, at providing um, accommodations for um, guests coming in from out of town to the, to the school. Um, and maybe as well a place that they could um, you know, have um, you know, calisthenics for their students and other um, at, you know, outdoor activities. But um, as they quickly discovered, um, was generating a great deal of, of popularity amongst African Americans living in this area who lacked anywhere else that they were allowed to go freely um, along the shorelines of, of, um, of Hampton. And, and soon, um, over time, what you know, originated as just a, you know, a small real estate investment soon grew into um, more land acquisitions. And then soon as well then became um, you know, that small four bedroom cottage that they originally built on the grounds became um, later a large hotel um, and even larger amusement park um, named Bayshore Beach, um, which attracted um, you know, crowds in the thousands um, you know, every summer. Um, you know, from you know, people coming in from across the state um, had, um, you know, excursion parties that would be coming in by train every summer weekend, um, flocking to um, a place that, again, was um, both reflecting and providing a means for expressing, um, you, know, the, you know, the demand for pleasure, but as well a sort of larger um, desire to be free, and how these were spaces that really kind of became um, a critically important place um, for um, African American life um, under um, the confines of Jim Crow. And so these, you know, these early, and also here as well, let me uh, as well give one more example here of another place, just to kind of capture here the rich, the diversity of the various types of places. I mean, we've talked here about um, an elite black summer resort, you know, a place where, you know, again, you know, families were, you know, you know, had, um, you know, it was very exclusive. Uh, I've described here amusement parks. I've also described, I mean, and I should have mentioned earlier, the place Seabreeze in, in Wilmington, North Carolina. I mean, that was much more of a working class place, you know, where, you know, folks would come in off the farms on the weekends and be able to, you know, find some rest for themselves and their families. Um, but you also had places like the Gulf Side Assembly. Um, down in Waveland, Mississippi, on the Gulf of Mexico. This was a religious resort retreat. Um, it was founded um, by, Robert E. Jones, the first African American bishop in the history of the Methodist Church, um, who in 1923 acquired um, a, an old seaside mansion um, and several hundred acres of property facing the Gulf of Mexico in Waveland, Mississippi, and there founded um, the Gulf Side Assembly, the nation's first seaside religious resort in Chautauqua for African Americans, um, and became this critically important space for um, generations of black Methodists. It's not just in um, 
the deep south, but from across the country um, who would come to this um, place that um, really, again, was um, you know, founded with this idea of both combining um, the need for leisure and recreation, but also um, having a distinct um, spiritual dimension to um, that work. Um, and you know, all these early developers of black recreational venues, all you know, despite the diverse visions of what they were aiming to do, despite the diverse range of, of, of crowds that they attracted, um, or in some cases tried to um, keep away, uh, you know, they all shared a desire to, to serve the needs for, um, for African Americans who had been excluded from so many other areas of, of um, you know, leisure spaces um, throughout the South. You know, they understood um, fellow African Americans' need for spaces of rest and relaxation. You know, the need for places where African Americans could find, as, as one writer put it, um, quote, rest from white folks as well as from labor. Um, you know, again, I love that. I use it all the time. It's just like, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't stress that enough, especially, again, living in this time in particular. You know, in places where you know, black folks could be amongst themselves, you know, where they could enjoy momentary respite um, from the, the brutal conditions they were, and, and humiliating conventions they were often facing in public life. Um, you know, one quote that I, you know, this is from a, a woman who I interviewed, um, and I you know, did you know, many oral history interviews in the course of doing research um, for this book, and, and this was um, a woman who had been heavily involved in, in golf side over the years and had gone down there, and I was, you know, she was describing this for me, um, and she said, quote, you know, describing what, you know, what golf side meant to her uh, as a child and as a, later as a teenager and, and young adult. Um, going down there, you know, again, you know, someone who lived in Mississippi um, in the 1940s and 50s, and she said, quote, it was just like being in heaven. When you got on golf sides grounds, your whole everything changed. If you went down and stayed a week, it was just like medicine. It was truly a spiritually uplifting place. You know, and, and you know, African Americans, you know, again, as I sort of, as I also you know, point out here, you know, just by showing the diverse types of places that I'm talking about, you know, they, they shared this desire for freedom from racial oppression, but they didn't always want to share it with each, you know, together. And I think one thing that I pay close attention to here are class differences within the African American communities I write about, how those often kind of became expressed and accentuated in social spaces. You know, how, again, there were places that, you know, like, like Highland Beach, that um, spent as much time trying to keep, you know, the sort of, you know, regular black folks from trying to come on their grounds as they tried to, you know, f fend off, you know, racist white attacks. You know, that they wanted, you know, these were, pl you know, places, especially some of the more elite places where they really stressed trying to have um, a level of exclusivity amongst themselves that was often denied to them in the larger society. And so oftentimes you could see, and as well, not just a kind of desire to exclude, but just also having different tastes and sensibilities and different ideas about what constituted recreation and leisure and what constituted, a, you know, um, how you wanted to spend the, your free time and how that kind of, again, became something that developers and proprietors of these types of places really tried to cater to and tried to kind of find their own niche within uh, an African-American leisure marketplace. Um, and so again, these were um, places that you know, really um, you know, kind of captured the richness and diversity of, of black life throughout this time period. And as I kind of you know, sort of alluded to a moment ago, you know, by the 1940s, you really begin, and really you know, in the post-World War II era, in the 1950s, and, and um, you, know, you begin to see uh, many of these places that had, had once you know, kind of attracted a small, but in a, in a very local crowd of, of pleasure seekers. You know, folks, you know, again, from, you know, within a certain, you know, kind of nearby geographical area, um, increasingly became, you know, regional, in some cases, national destinations for African American families, um, for, for groups um, who would flock to places like Cars Beach, 
um, you know, outside of Annapolis, you know, that you know was hosting, um, you know, not just you know large crowds every summer weekend, um, you know, groups, of, you know, in some cases, you know, groups of African Americans from places as far away as Ohio who would charter buses and drive out to um, Cars Beach and spend a weekend there, and also as well stay in some of the ho you know um, the hotels and do drop-ins and other places that um, you know, would host African Americans in from out of town. All of these were springing up around. Cars Beach as well. So you know these were places were supporting this, um, you know, you know, supporting a local black economy in a lot of ways and spawning lots of kinds of different forms of enterprise from from folks who were you know turning their kitchens into um, you know seasonal restaurants and serving meals or or um, hosting families staying in their. Um, in their spare rooms. I mean, if you, I mean, I'm sure probably many of you have heard about the Green Book. This was uh, a travel guide that um, African Americans used to navigate their way through um, Jim Crow America, you know, to where you can stay in certain towns, you know, what restaurants you can stay at. And, and I mean, you know, again, in places like, in, in parts of the coastal south, many of those places that were listed in the Green Book were around places like these beaches. You know, these were magnets um, drawing together and spawning a whole host of activities, um, not just social, but also um, economic. Um, and as well here, I mean, when, um, you know, just um, not far from here, Bayshore Beach. I mean, this was um, a place that, as I write about, um, you know, Bayshore Beach was, um, you know, a tr was spawning a whole host of different um, activities. It was bringing in, um, you know, it was you know, local black radio stations were hosting shows there. Um, local celebrities were emceeing concerts there. Um, you know, and as well, you know, major mu musical acts, um, touring artists. Um, who would be coming and performing oftentimes, and oftentimes they would be performing, you know, one night at Cards Beach up in Maryland, the next night they'd be performing down here at Bayshore Beach, and then they'd be on to Freeman Beach down, you know, the next night. I mean, these were the kind of, you know, the nodes on, on um, African American musicians, um, you know, summer touring schedules. In fact, that was actually where I first kind of stumbled upon this topic, it was through my interest in looking at the history of African American mu musicians and musical acts in the 1950s at this time where you began to see artists um, breaking into a you know, mainstream um, you know, sort of audience and beginning to really attract a following amongst um, you know, white listeners. And I was you know, going back and I kept you know, I was seeing, well, where were they touring? What were the sort of, what were the, you know, who were they playing to? And it just kept on coming across places that were like you know, this beach and that beach. And I was like, there must be something here. You know? And so that was, um, and so you know, here Bayshore Beach was in particular one, um, a very important one um, that was also, you know, again, um, you know, really uh, had a lot of local significance as well. You know, another aspect that I talk about, though, in the book is, um, you know, how uh, these were, you know, the, the, the demand for leisure spaces amongst African American populations living in the Jim Crow South was not just, um, it was not just a matter of, you know, kind of having, um, so, you know, social spaces, uh, places where the community could gather, but it was also a matter of public health. And what I mean by that is, is that you know, the, one of the results of um, the segregation, uh, the thorough segregation and exclusion of African Americans, families, children, from parks, from swimming pools, from other kind of organized, supervised places of play that we now, you know, again, became a common feature of American cities um, in the 20th century. One of the byproducts of African Americans being not just you know, thoroughly excluded from these spaces, um, but also didn't really, you know, again, denied um, any opportunities um, for spaces of their own, at least initially, by um, southern cities like Norfolk, um, like Washington, D.C., like um, you know, Charleston, South Carolina, is that um, there were, as I found early on in this research, there was a shockingly high number of drowning deaths amongst black youth every summer because, again, People need places to go and play and, and have fun. And if you have no places um, that are in any way organized, supervised, or being provided for by cities, um, you know, drowning deaths were one of the tragic but all too predictable results of that. And what that did was it really galvanized and you know, stepped up demands amongst African Americans living in cities like Norfolk, living um, you know, to, to demand of city leaders to provide spaces for black people, you know, 
provide beaches. You know, if you're going to be put, you know, taking our tax dollars as, as black people living in this city and using those tax dollars to provide for white beaches and white only parks and white only um, swimming pools, then we deserve places of our own. And you know, that was one of the kind of, you know, before the demand turned toward desegregation of all spaces, it began with a demand for equality under a separate order. And so I, you know, many of the beaches that we find and, 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 and um, leisure spaces that um, took shape in southern cities um, grew out of this very real concern um, amongst, mostly amongst you know, families of you know, young children of, of just the kind of real life, or de life and death consequences of this, these policies of, of neglect. Um, and so many of these were, you know, again, were in direct response to demands of African Americans um, for the cities to provide some measure of equal treatment um, in regards to um, its allocation of leisure and recreational spaces. Um, and so I kind of, again, sort of talk about how black citizens were forcing city leaders to create public beaches for black people. Um, and again, often these were smaller and inferior accommodations, and often in remote locations because there was, as I write about, you know, especially in Norfolk, I mean, this you know, played out over almost a, a decade where every time the city, city leaders would identify a spot along the, the, the you know, waterfront that they wanted to acquire for an African American beach, you know, whites living in the area would all mobilize to prevent it from being um, you know, sold and designated for that use. And then you know, the city, of course, would cowardly back down. Uh, and it just became back, and then again, um, you know, blacks in Norfolk would step up their demands. Um, in fact, in some of the earliest wait-ins, you know, where you know, kind, kind of taking direct action, you know, some like similar to sit-ins and the like, you know, many of the early wait-ins that took place at whites-only beaches grew out of this demand for spaces of their, for themselves. You know, saying if you won't provide us with equal accommodations, then we're just going to come onto your beach. And so again, this was very much sort of you know in line with the broader set of strategies that were aimed at chipping away at the foundations of Jim Crow. Um, so I guess the kind of, again, the sort of seriousness of, of play in the South at this time. But just as, um, you know, many of these places were becoming um, viable, sometimes lucrative enterprises um, that provided jobs and livelihoods for, for, for many African Americans, there were the, as I, as I write about in the book, there were other things that were happening here in the coastal South. Um, that you know, other changes that were taking place um, to coastal real estate um, during these decades um, that would ultimately contribute to the demise of so many of these um, places that played such an important um, role in black life um, in the 20th century. And as I kind of argue in the book, it wasn't just the desegregation of public beaches uh, and public leisure spaces that led to um, the demise of so many of the black beaches and resorts that I write about in the book. It wasn't as if you know, all of a sudden you know, whites only, white beaches became available to African Americans and they abandoned the places of their own. That was definitely not the case. Um, what happened instead was, and I think was much more crucial to um, explaining what was happening and ultimately conspiring against um, the survival of many of these places was just how valuable this property was becoming and how coveted it was be, um, becoming to developers, um, to city officials who wanted to see it put to some other use, who wanted to maximize its real estate value and therefore maximize the property taxes it could be gained from it. There was all these uh, larger interests that were playing out that were leading to both what I describe, and you know, I think this picture captures pretty um, you know, profoundly, the overdevelopment of coastal areas. Just the, you know, this effort to squeeze as much value out of coastal real estate, to put as many homes there, to put as much, uh, to kind of, you know, again, um, you know, exploit it to at the nth degree, that that um, is really um, one thing that is very much putting pressure on, on many of the places, and as well, the fact that um, not just was the demand for these places, um, but also the fact that, there, um, that the African Americans who own these properties at the time, and who might have, who were, in many cases I write about, were trying to capitalize on the land that they own themselves. Um, but they couldn't get financing from banks, they couldn't get, you know, city leaders were completely um, 
indifferent, if not hostile, to their interest. Oftentimes, and again, this is um, the subject of the book I'm working on right now, which is you know, one of the things that was happening to many African American landowners at this time was that they were being subject to forms of discriminatory overtaxation, you know, often intentional on the part of local governments, seeking to kind of push communities out by you know, sort of over, you know, sort of taxing them off the land. Um, this was happening to many places. In fact, actually, you know, um, that was a contributing factor to um, the demise of Bayshore Beach here in Hampton was um, the rising property taxes that were just becoming um, too much of a burden for the owners to be able to um, meet. And so, you know, all of these, again, are sort of, you know, happening at the very same time. And ironically, in some respects, it's because of the achievements of the civil rights movement in actually you know, making the South a place that more people from outside of the South wanted to come to. You know, in fact, you know, again, as, as you know, after the end of demise of Jim Crow, you see the kind of rise of the Sun Belt, of this kind of, you know, you know, southern states begin to really grow in population. You start to see lots of people migrating to the south from places like, I'm from Ohio, there are so many people from Ohio who've moved down to places like South Carolina. Um, and so, you know, again, this is, um, you know, happening at this very same time as um, African Americans are, who are owning these places are kind of struggling to both hold on to their customer base, but also struggling in the face of these, all these forces being aligned against them. And so this, again, are, these are some images of some of the places um, that I write about in the book and whose histories I tell um, today. You know, um, you know, these places, as I described, were kind of in the crosshairs of, of, of a form of real estate capitalism that um, had no sort of use for separate black um, leisure spaces um, that um, had developed in, or the communities that had formed around them. And so my book kind of describes you know, what happened and sort of follows the story of these places after um, the end of Jim Crow and how you know, in many of these booming markets, it was you know, common for local taxing officials to overassess the value of black owned land, forcing families into tax delinquency, um, you know, of, of, of developers who were often very unscrupulous in their um, aims and trying to you know, get a hold of property, often at you know, below market value, and then turning around and making a, you know, a fortune off of the rising um, you know, value of coastal property. Um, this was, you know, again, you know, many places that today, may, may, probably many of us in this room have maybe even gone and vacationed at, like Hilton Head, South Carolina. I mean, that was, until the 1950s, almost entirely African American owned and occupied. Um, you know, I've interviewed people who said that they grew up on Hilton Head in the 1940s and never saw a white face until they were in their teenage years. Um, today, again, it is home to, you know, you know gated communities, golf courses, um, and the African American families who once lived on, those, on that land um, saw very little, if anything, um, from the, the rising value of that property. So that's kind of as well why, to say at the, you know, that this is also really a story of, of, of how black land um, became white wealth and the sort of process of dispossession um, that unfolded really over the last um, you know, you know, half century and continues um, to this day. Um, and, and I think you know, this, um, you know, here again, you know, this, um, you know, the, these, these images here uh, of, of gated communities and resorts that um, you know, sit on the sites of places like Bayshore Beach, like Cars Beach, um, and, and of the descendants of these families um, who saw nothing of the value that it now generates, um, I think offers us a really um, important, urgent um, sort of you know, reckoning with um, not just the legacy of slavery and, um, and Jim Crow as a sort of legacy of denial of opportunities. Um, you know, again, we oftentimes think about you know, the injustice of, of, of segregation as, as what it denied um, from African Americans. But I think also we need to think about and understand what was being taken from them. 
um, not just their labor, but also their assets, and how that was one of the ways in which sort of racism within how, um, real estate was, you know, you know, was ruthlessly, often you know, brutally effective in, in liquidating African-American assets and, and robbing communities of these you know, important um, cultural um, spaces. Um, and as well, again, you know, not just you know, places for communities to come together, but places where small businesses formed, where um, a variety of, of, of enterprises that um, sustained uh, black life and communities throughout um, the, the long storm of Jim Crow um, were then themselves struggling in new ways with the new challenges that came afterward. Um, so that's again the sort of this, you know, sort of in a, in, a, in a nutshell. I guess maybe a big nut, but like that in a nutshell, that is the sort of um, story and the, the, that this book aims to tell and get it as a think here about sort of you know what the lessons that that um, offers for us today as we're thinking about and reckoning with um, not you know the sort of long legacy of racial injustice and beginning to think about what. Um, what comes next. So I will, um, I just want to you know, stop there and I guess really um, I think more than anything, especially given um, how you know, the, this story probably has a lot of real you know, local significance as well, um, I'd love to um, hear questions, thoughts, reflections um, from, from you as well. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Carl. And we do have time for some questions. So if you have uh, any questions to ask, I'll bring a, the microphone to you. I'm going to start over here. I'll come right back to you. No, no, uh, we're, since we're on Facebook Live, we need the microphone so everybody else can hear you. Does your research, first of all, I enjoyed your presentation, but Thank does you. your research at all address the, the terroristic tactics that were used to when, when people were chased and and just homes were on fire and they were thrown off their land and they were completely just thrown away, ran away the best way they could, left hanging in trees and so forth and they couldn't go back to their property and then the land was taken and, and still is big, was in some cases it's a different word for it, a different term, mm -hmm. but auctioned off. Uh, it wasn't just taxes in, case of, in mm -hmm. the case of the Bayshore and Buckrow Beach. I, I've been here for seven years. I couldn't even, I had to search and ask, where was everything located? Mm -hmm. There was barely a marker seen, and I thought that was so awful. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the people who wanted to, um, who, from Hampton University, those, those people who wanted to invest in Buckrow and make it the, the hotel that it was, it was part of the Chitlin circuit. Mm -hmm. And it was the resort and leisure activity that you spoke of. They couldn't get, when the fire came and burned everything down, and they couldn't get financing, and it went into different hands and couldn't get financing. Mm -hmm. Are you addressing any, all those elements that nationwide, I was watching a story about Ocoee, Florida. Yep. And how things happened in Ocoee, Florida, where people were completely thrown off ran off Tulsa. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go on and on and on about yeah. land just being taken, yep. and it still is. And it's more than just taxes. Mm -hmm. It was just complete robbery. Absolutely. And I think, um, yes, in fact, almost every one of these sites that I mentioned at, at one point or another encountered a form of racial terrorism, attacks on the property. Um, that big seaside mansion at Gulfside was burned down in a case of suspected arson. Um, there was many other places that I write about that never even were able to get off the ground because they um, were uh, attacked um, by you know, terrorists you know, before, at, even before they um, were able to cut the ribbon on, on, on these developments. And I think it's important as well, to, to, and, I, and I discuss this um, at various points, is how oftentimes it was that initial attack on, on, on landowners, uh, you know, driving out entire communities. Um, you know, the case, there's a notorious case in Forsyth County, uh, Georgia, um, that was the subject of a book a couple years ago, um, Blood at the Root, which I think, you know, tells the story of an entire, you know, racial cleansing of an entire, um, you know, African-American community in Georgia. And then it was after the fact that they would tidy things up by saying, oh, it, the land was lost to taxes, you know. So it's not to say that this wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just a kind of bloodless form of, you know, book, bookkeeping that was happening. 
And oftentimes that would be what was done after the fact to make the title clean so that the whites could then claim ownership of land that they'd stolen um, other, by other means. So I think that's maybe one thing to that I should have mentioned earlier when I was describing that is that usually violence and attacks preceded these kind of legalistic forms of dispossession. Um, but certainly, I mean, and I think what's What's remarkable is, is how many of these places, not many, you know, many of them never saw the light of day, but many others persevered. And they did so in the face of not being able to get you know, insurance, not being able to get financing. I mean, these were you know, real just sweat equity being poured into to land in this determined effort to not succumb to the forces of racial terror that often characterized those places that were able to persevere throughout these years. But I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this is, um, you know, you cannot sort of tell this story without also um, you know, recognizing that um, the shadow of terror that um, faced all African American um, landowners um, and was, was from the outset structuring what land they could acquire in the first place. I mean, you know, these, again, you know, there was places that um, were just simply unavailable for acquisition or area, entire areas were unavailable for acquisition because of that reality. So I think that's, but that, thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Carl, okay. the very informative. I appreciate the, the historical perspective mm -hmm. of blacks and land ownership, mm -hmm. particularly coastal, but land ownership for blacks in general. Mm -hmm. So I would like your perspective on how history continues. Property ownership for blacks continue to be elusive for many blacks in many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, you still find whites that don't want to sell, you know, to, to blacks. You still find um, blacks, as you just mentioned a moment ago, not being able to get um, loans. Mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, different levels of financing for blacks as opposed to whites. So, you know, and you have gentrification going on in many of these cities where in some ways property is being taken from blacks. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know, you know, how you, you know, how that continues mm -hmm. today, if that's the right way it, to it put is, it. It is, absolutely. And I think if, not to get kind of too deep you know, into the weeds here as, as far as historians go, but I mean, this, what this book hopes to, hope to contribute to was this real um, you know, growing focus amongst scholars who've looked at um, African American history, looked at you know, US history in, in the 20th century through the lens of housing and real estate, and looked at you know, the long history of being denied access to credit, the redlining of African American neighborhoods, the predation of black homeowners um, by, say, you know, again, you know, we see this in, you know, through gentrification and the kind of ways in which you know, um, you know, neighborhoods and communities are being preyed upon um, by those who are seeking to acquire and take their property. Um, we see this as well in the sort of devaluation of, of um, African American property assets that, um, you know, again, has something that, this is something I think is an important sort of way of, of kind of pushing back on some of the standard narratives we have um, in our political conversations in America where it's understood that home ownership is this universal good that is going to, that benefits all owners equally. That, you know, the way to, um, for any family to enter and stay in the middle class and build wealth in America is to buy a home. Well, that's a white story. That works for white people. Um, it doesn't always work for African Americans, and it's because of the way that race structures housing markets, it, the way it devalues black spaces, or sort of leaves them vulnerable um, to these forms of, of dispossession when, say, it does be become valuable. We see, I mean, you know, my, my friend and colleague, um, who um, Nathan Connolly, I don't know if any of you saw this story a couple weeks ago. Um, he's a professor at Johns Hopkins University, um, African American um, professional. He and his, his wife also is a professor at Johns Hopkins University. Um, when you know interest rates were really low this past year, they um, went to um, to get their house reappraised so that they could, or they went to get um, you know to kind of um, refinance their mortgage. Um, and as part of that, they had to get um, their um, property appraised. Well, when the first, when the, um, the, the company that came in to do the appraisal, um, you know, appraised the property, 
uh, came in at having not gained, and, and this is in spite of the fact that we also know that the housing market's been going through the roof and, over the last year. When they got it, it appraised, um, they came back saying that they hadn't gained any value at all. So what, what did they do? Well, they went and they first removed every sign that this was an African-American family from their house, took down their kids' paintings, took down every book that had to do with black history on their library shelves, took down every painting on the walls. They, you know, Nathan even had one of his colleagues, um, a white colleague, go and pretend to be the owner of the house. Um, then they got a second appraisal company to come in. It came in at about like three hundred thousand dollars higher. I mean, it was. It was uh, I mean, I might, I might be off on the numbers, but it was a significantly different appraisal. So again, right there. I mean, race, racism is just permeates every aspect of the U.S. housing industry, and it has really from the beginning of of the housing industry itself. I mean, the color line and the drawing of that color line. Um, in housing markets was explicitly aimed to generate profit on both sides. One for whites who owned property that they could have as appreciating assets, and then on the black side of the color line so you could plunder and exploit, again, in cities where African Americans are being forced to pay exorbitant rents because they have no other options. I mean, all of this functions to generate profits that very little finds its way into the hands of black people. And I think we need to sort of be be honest about this and ultimately kind of identify um, what's driving this, who benefits from it, and what are the costs for all of us, but especially what are the costs for, for generations of African Americans who continue to be structurally disadvantaged in the marketplace that has become the vehicle for wealth building in America. So again, when we want to ask, okay, where is, when, why do we see this wealth gap in America that's so wide and just keeps on getting wider still? We need to go back and look at how housing and real estate works in this country and how it works against African Americans. And I, I hope if in some way, you know, this book, which again was is a small contribution to this longer history that I'm aiming to, that I think, you know, there's so many other scholars have been really doing incredible work on. All right, I've got uh, three more hands up here, here, and over here. Uh, keep your questions a little bit focused and keep your answer a little bit focused. We'll get all this done. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> and we'll, we'll be here all night if you want to. Oh, yes, yeah. It's 8 o'clock and folks will be getting dressed. Sure, sure, yes. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for all of your research. Okay. Um, really appreciate all the things that you provided here and all the work that it took to do this kind of research. Uh, I did have a couple of questions, try to keep it um, short. Um, have any of the black beaches survived? So yeah, and I think, again, um, Highland Beach in Maryland remains um, a small, insular, but very vibrant uh, community where the children, you know, again, the direct descendants of, of you know, John Mercer Langston, you know, African-American congressman during Reconstruction, I mean, his, you know, great-great-grandchildren um, still live there. I mean, there are places that have, you know, really kept, but, but many of them, um, haven't, and I think and it's no coincidence that those who that have survived um, were the places that were homes to the black elite, um, that they had the resources, um, the connections that were able to allow them to weather that storm and be able to fend off um, some of the threats that succumb so many other places. Um, so yeah, that's, I think, you know, a quick answer to that question. Okay, it sounded like you were making a comparison when you said there, there were city sit-ins in cities mm -hmm. and wait-ins um, on the coastal area, coastal area. So are we spelling it wait like how much I weigh? No, wait in, like, like they wait in the water. Like they would wait, oh, wait. so like literally, in fact, I, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I thought it was no, W-A-I-T. No, no, no. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, so in fact, actually, I mean, one of the, um, you know, one of the most famous or infamous um, wait-ins took place right on the eve of the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act um, in St. Augustine, Florida, um, where African Americans waded into the ocean waters and were viciously attacked um, and beaten by you know gangs of white hoodlums swinging baseball bats. And in fact, and some some have credited that was actually the horrific scenes that um, transpired on that beachfront in Florida maybe provided that last push that needed to get the Civil Rights Act um, over the finish line in the summer of 1964. So yeah, wait-ins were you know, really important um, okay. form okay. of protest during the Civil Rights Movement. Okay, um, the other thing you, it, if, I don't know if I heard you correctly, 
at the beginning when you were talking about the coastal areas, you said something about there was also a difference in race relations. Um, in my mind, uh, I thought you were saying that maybe some of the white people and black people, white people in those areas were less um, antagonistic. The, I, think, I think it's fair to say that that was somewhat the case in the sense that, again, you know, relatively speaking here, I mean, given just how thoroughly and violently racist um, much of the South was during the uh, early 20th century, but I think there's a difference in degree in the sense that you know, these were not the types of places where African Americans were being um, confined to sharecropping, to the kinds of really um, vicious and exploitative labor relations. Um, again, many African Americans who were seeking out and acquiring land were, you know, independent landholders. I mean, they were not in any way um, economically dependent on whites, and nor were many of the whites who were living in coastal areas at that time economically dependent on African Americans or had a need to kind of keep their labor in place, and so I think that kind of changed things a bit. Um, yeah, and, Af and also as well, I mean, in many, you know, in coastal areas as well, there's a long history of African American, um, you know, African Americans working in uh, maritime industries, um, and, you know, and a lot, of, so some of the kind of things that we think of as like hard and fast segregation was not often, you know, happening in these places. And one more quick one, um, <laughs> I have others, but um, the drowning deaths. Mm -hmm. How were those reported? I, I would think it, it would be only in black newspapers. How? Yeah. how that's, that's where I found it. I mean, again, I had to go through and, you know, the Norfolk Journal and Guide, uh, Louisiana Weekly. I mean, the, you know, there was a vibrant African-American press uh, across the South and across the nation that was reporting on the injustices of Jim Crow every day in their newspapers and including, um, and oftentimes, you know, these were reported as just individual tragedies. They weren't, like, I mean, it took a while before suddenly like mothers and civic groups and later, you know, even like local chapters, the NAACP would say, wait a minute, something's going on here. And this isn't just a couple of accidents. Like this is a crisis. And so I think that was something that took a while to sort of build up. But I think that was something that um, certainly, again, when it came to like, you know, white officials or city leaders, they often blame the victims. They would say, well, you should have done a better job looking after your child. I mean, just ho horrible sort of, you know, kind of, you know, just dismissing it as not even something that they, you know, concern themselves with. It was something that really, you know, people had to put on the agenda. Um, you know, it wasn't something that, you know, that cities themselves, you know, concern themselves with until they had to. Yeah. I, uh, re also, remember that uh, uh, one of your earlier questions, Bayshore was capitalized, the investment groups that made, brought it into existence in the 1890s, again in the 1940s, was entirely uh, African-American businessmen and, and mm -hmm. uh, financial resources. Yeah. That, that was both called into existence twice by, uh, mm -hmm. by its own investment. Groups. Yeah. Well, based on my experience living in Hampton for a while, although I'm not a native, I didn't go to Hampton High School, so I never have the proper pedigree. But you could substitute public for black in that title mm. because what's happened in Hampton mm -hmm. is there's nowhere near as much public beach available as it was when I first moved mm -hmm. down here. Grandview is a good example. My wife used to go down to Grandview and sunbathe all the time. Now there's a bunch of upscale houses down there, right? Mm -hmm. so, and this is, I think that's, yeah. Of course, quite. Forgetting about the two parking garages down here on the waterfront. <laughs> no, and I think this is a great point you make, and I think this is, I can't, can't be stressed enough, is that the demise of many um, of this, these small family-owned or community, um, you know, public, often, you know, again, for you know, hosting and, and a, a black public at this time, the demise of many of these places was happening alongside of really the, the broader privatization of public space. Um, and shorelines were really, um, you know, indicative of how many places in America that were kind of treated as a commons. And, and I think here's something that you know, can't be stressed enough as well is that Legally speaking, the beach is public property. You know, this belongs to all of us. Um, and yet we've been seeing over the course of really, um, you know, especially over the last, you know, several decades, um, especially, you know, that we've been seeing, you know, piece by piece, these places are getting fenced off. They're getting, you know, privatized or being, you know, again, something that is, you know, we're all losing. 
Um, at, you know, and that is, I think it's no coincidence that that's happening at the same time that, um, that African Americans are losing the places that they had built up for themselves during this time, that this is, the, these two are kind of connected together. And as I kind of also talk about at the end of the book, it's like this also has environmental implications, especially as we're facing the threat of sea level rise and climate change, that, you know, um, as, you know, as we're putting all this money all this, you know, in, you know, all this development into coastal areas that had once been just sea-swept, undeveloped places that had, you know, again, kind of, you know, were well understood to be places that it wasn't smart to build homes on. I mean, that was the thing. I mean, again, that these were places that um, were understood to be, you know, not areas that were really conducive to the types of development that we see today. And now, um, so much of the, you know, so much of, you know, is in harm's way. We have time for one more. Yeah. Hi. So that kind of answered my question um, a little bit, but I guess to be more specific, in land ownership, are you separating private home ownership and farmland and the private uh, beach waterfront property? And if so, how does separating that or equating the two play into overdevelopment and public spaces? I know you touched on that a little bit, but do you? So meaning, you mean in terms of like, the amount of acreages, amount of acreage Af African Americans owned, or in terms of kind of the impact of development on farmland versus, say, urban real estate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that these. I mean, what's happening, you know, especially again during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and still to this day, is so much of that farmland that African Americans owned um, is becoming real estate is becoming homes. I mean, become, because, you know, southern cities are growing in size, you know, they're swelling. I mean, you know, again, you know, Princess Anne County, which today is known as Virginia Beach. I mean, Princess Anne County was home in the early 20th century to one of the largest concentrations of black landowners in the U.S. This was a place, you know, the, that, you know, what today is now just sprawling, you know, um, subdivisions, um, residential developments, there was significant amounts of that that was farmland that was owned by African Americans, you know, small truck farmers who were, you know, you know producing goods for, um, you know, Atlantic seaboard markets. And, you know, this was, these were areas that were, again, rural farmland that today is urban real estate. And I think that was something that was happening across the South. It's happening across the country. Um, and so, you know, places that were, at one time, remote areas where African Americans could acquire a piece of land, you know, build a homestead, um, you know, build family and community, um, increasingly became as southern cities are swelling in size and developers are kind of eyeing these areas and saying, look, this is, you know, let's, and of course, all of this needs the active help and assistance of local officials who are rezoning these areas. And that's you know, what might lead exactly. to, if you could, yes. if we have a second, what role did the city of Hampton play in Bayshore? Ooh, that, all right, now you've got, now you know the limits of my expertise in terms of like, like, I mean, I know in particular, you know, again, that um, taxes were becoming particular owners. I do not know the specifics, and I'm sure, hopefully, there's someone um, who is the keeper of local knowledge on these types of things who could, and I think maybe as well, if someone wants to go dive back into those records that I um, looked at at Hampton University many years ago, I'm sure there can be more to be uncovered about what was happening. I don't remember the particulars off the top of my head about, you know, how areas were being rezoned around where Bayshore Beach was. But um, that always is something that's happening. It's often, you know, again, a precursor to other changes that are unfolding um, in ways that can really um, be, you know, dis on, on someone's ability to hold on to land. Because, you know, again, once it's rezoned, then you can tax it at a different rate. Um, you know, again, the you know, development begins to crowd around it, and it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think that's really um, you know, something that continues to this day. But no, thank you for your question. All right, what a wonderful presentation and great <laughs> thank questions. You. Thank you. Thanks. I remember those things that I mentioned uh, when we first started that are still going on going around here. This book that we just heard about tonight is in our gift store. Gift store is open, and uh, you can buy a copy if you would like on, on your way out. Or stay with us for a while. Maybe you could audition for our uh, Hampton Horror Tours. But uh, thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>